Hi everyone, my name is Mike, and today we are going to take a look to another horrible case with you. On June 8, 1995, Pauline Zile heard a decision on the crime committed in court. The woman was very lucky because she was able to avoid the death penalty, since for her offense it was decided to be limited to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Pauline's face was swollen from tears. She took the lawyer's hand, instinctively expecting support. Despite the sad end, she was able to avoid being held in a cell still awaiting execution, along with five other death row inmates. Pauline Zile was a hardworking woman who worked two jobs to provide for her children. Her first daughter, Christine, was born from a previous marriage. The woman gave birth to two more boys to her second husband, John. Chad, three years old, and Daniel, five years old at the time of the tragedy. Keep in mind that the daughter from her first marriage did not live with her mother for some time and grew up with her father's relatives in Maryland. For a long time, many of those who knew the family considered Pauline a good example of a mother. Despite the fact that Pauline abandoned her biological mother as a child and was raised in a foster family, no one could even guess that she could pose a danger to society, and especially to her loved ones. Her daughter Christine lived with Judy Hold, her paternal grandmother, and got along well with her. Shortly before the terrible events, the grandmother handed the girl over to her mother in Florida. Due to a long separation, the girl did not experience much joy upon reuniting with her mother. Nevertheless, in June 1994, she found herself with her mother in a small two-room apartment in Riviera Beach. Her two brothers and stepfather, who received the child rather coldly, also lived there. Family relations were very tense, and after four months, Polina turned to the police, reporting that her daughter had been abducted in a crowded place. The seven-year-old girl went to the ladies' room in a store but did not return. The mother couldn't find her, and Kupalin filed a statement. The police started searching for the girl, and when the woman appeared on television, pleading for the return of her daughter, no one suspected that these sincere emotions could be fake. As detectives investigated the family dynamics, individuals close to the couple revealed frequent conflicts. It turned out that the tension in the family was not only due to the arrival of the girl, Polina's relationship with her second husband was also challenging. They quarreled every day, and the man dominated their relationship harshly. If something went wrong, he didn't hesitate to use force. Neighbors repeatedly heard him arguing with his wife, abusing her and mistreating the daughter. Investigators speculated that the girl might have run away because of accumulated grievances from her mother and stepfather, heading towards her grandmother, with whom her childhood had been carefree. They started checking this version. The grandmother claimed that she had not seen the girl since she gave her to her mother, although she missed her greatly. Interviewing witnesses in the store and the surrounding area also did not provide any useful information. No one saw a girl similar in description that day. There were no surveillance cameras at that time. Searches for Christina were actively conducted near the store, but all efforts were in vain. Then detectives received a crucial lead. It turned out that the mother of the missing Polina had sold her bicycle and videotapes. Moreover, when these transactions became known at the school where the girl was studying, the mother replied that they would no longer be needed. Although at that time everyone still hoped that the girl was alive, it sounded extremely alarming. Investigators then speculated that perhaps the girl was not even in the store on that day, and the entire story from the mother was simply a fabrication to mislead the investigation. Two weeks after the disappearance, the police obtained a search warrant and visited the house where the girl lived with her mother. There, they conducted extensive searches. However, this did not help. Nothing was found. At that moment, the mother of the girl, as the last person who had seen the child alive, became the primary suspect. But soon the situation changed radically. A few days later, a sobbing Polina Zile came to the police with a confession. She said that her husband had beaten her daughter to death, but insisted that the incident was an accident. The woman described in detail the last minutes of the life of Christine, who became a victim of domestic violence from her 32-year-old stepfather. The mother told police she made up the kidnapping story to mislead law enforcement officials. Concealing the traces of the crime subsequently became one of the points in the bitter mother's long guilty verdict. John Zile, her husband, lived with Pauline and their sons in a very small apartment, and there was not enough money. Probably living conditions became one of the unpleasant factors provoking a negative attitude towards the girl. On September 16, 1994, John once again raised his hand against little Christine. The reason was that she was very dirty, and the girl also had problems with incontinence. Neighbors heard a row start through the wall. The man screamed, then began to cry, but the child did not look like ordinary children's tears. Neighbors heard dull thuds. The child began to scream louder, then the sound was muffled. 
Only after this, the girl's mother asked her husband to stop. As it turned out, at the moment when Christine fell unconscious and began to convulse, her stepfather severely beat her stepdaughter so that she would not scream, covered her mouth with his hand, which is why she suffocated. When everything calmed down, the neighbors heard the voice of a man who was worried and scared. The parents hid the body in a closet where it lay for a week. And only after that, they took her to a vacant lot behind the shopping center and buried her. The woman agreed to show the girl's burial place. On October 27th, Christine's grave was discovered. The girl's body was in a terrible state. She was in a severe state of decomposition and there was literally no living space on her from the beatings. Forensic experts confirmed Pauline's words that the cause of death was strangulation. The child suffocated and covered his face with his hands. Detectives were able to establish that while the body was in the closet, the couple carefully prepared for her burial. They purchased a shovel, tarp, cleaning supplies, and other necessary items to bury the body. The girl's own mother acted extremely prudently. She pawned the girl's things, a bicycle and videotapes, in a pawn shop. She later admitted that she did this to get the memories of her out of her head. However, all these items were purchased with the proceeds to carry out the burial and cleaning of the house. Pauline claimed that the husband who killed the girl was to blame for everything, but later important details became clear. John reported that Pauline never intervened during the beating of her daughter. And on that day, when he went too far in bullying the girl, the man suggested that Pauline call for help and save her while she was still alive, but she refused. During interrogation, the woman admitted this. In her opinion, the girl could still be saved, but John was afraid to take her to the hospital. He was afraid of responsibility for what he had done. The husband gave the woman a choice. She could call the police or an ambulance herself, but she was scared and did not want to do this. Law enforcement officials found out that this was not the first time Christine was bullied. However, her mother never stood up for her to stop the inappropriate punishments. Even when she called her mother during her stepfather's bullying, she remained indifferent. Zeal's wife were arrested and charged with child abuse and concealment of evidence. At the time of the trial, Poland was 25 years old. Christina Hold was seven years old. The accused was left with two more children, whom she had to give up. A child who was three years old and five-year-old Daniel. She had to lose her parental rights, realizing this at the first hearing. Pauline herself abandoned her sons officially. According to the children's lawyer, they were adopted by a couple who were not related to the killer. First Pauline trial began. Pauline did not admit her guilt, blaming her husband for everything. The lawyer argued that the child's death was the result of an accident, but the accusing party eloquently countered such arguments. After all, there are facts of violent death. The defense argued that there were many mitigating circumstances in this case. The woman was a wonderful mother, her colleagues spoke warmly, and the prosecution voiced the opinion that the only part of the crime that did not directly involve the victim's mother was the beating and strangulation. Lawyers tried to prove that Pauline was under the power of her tyrant husband, who kept her in fear. She had no opportunity to argue, since her husband always physically suppressed such impulses. But the prosecutor emphasized that, according to Pauline herself, she could have saved her daughter but chose to abandon this idea. The relatives of the deceased girl, including her grandmother, who raised her for many years, reported that from the very beginning, when Christina was born, her mother considered her unnecessary and was not eager to take care of her. They regretted that seven years later, they returned their daughter to her mother at her request, in the hope that she would reform, and just four months later she was brutally killed. According to the prosecution, the boyfriend played a key role in the murder of his own daughter. The prosecution regarded Pauline's act as a case contrary to the very nature of the mother. She did not fulfill her duties as a parent, which implies protecting the child. She didn't even try to help her daughter by calling an ambulance. However, the defendant's lawyers continued to argue with this interpretation of events. No one had any doubt that the Zile couple were guilty of the girl's death. At the trial, the jury reached its decision after deliberating for an hour and a half. They supported the prosecution. According to the unanimous decision of the jury, Pauline was found guilty of murder in the first degree, since she was next to her husband who hit the girl. In addition, she took an active part in hiding traces of the crime until the child was buried in a vacant lot. As a result, the woman was sentenced to life, with another 13 years added for concealing evidence in child abuse. Under state law, Pauline will not be eligible for parole. When Pauline's verdict was announced, tears of joy flowed from her eyes. The woman was happy that she managed to avoid the death penalty in the electric chair. Despite the facts of blatant cruelty on the part of her own mother, lawyers planned to appeal the verdict considering it outrageous, but their appeals were rejected. The prosecutor said the sentence was a warning to abusive parents. This caused a huge response in the hearts of everyone who learned about it. 
It is for this reason that the jury even had to be changed so that their opinion was objective. According to law enforcement, about 57% of the lineup needed to be disqualified. This is due to the fact that people could not overcome the bias that was directed against the accused. Everyone was shocked by the fact that her own mother did not interfere in the execution of her own daughter until the very end, did not insist on calling the rescue service, and took an active part in covering up the traces of the terrible crime. The public outcry resulted in a whole wave of protests. Experts argued that in most cases, children are killed by their own parents. The situation was aggravated by the fact that shortly before the bloody events described, a whole wave of similar crimes took place. For example, Susan Smith drowned her two sons, a one-year-old baby and a three-year-old boy, for the sake of a rich man, and tried to frame her husband for the crime. She was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 30 years. Very soon she will receive this right. In November 2024, in California, Dora Boinstrew killed her three children. The youngest of them was four years old. The others were eight and nine years old. She similarly tried to blame her estranged husband. The woman had a bitter custody battle over her children. The man was saved by his alibi as he was hundreds of kilometers away when his children were killed by his own mother. She was sentenced to death back in 1998. Dora is still on death row awaiting sentencing. Many similar stories have surfaced in the media, the most notorious of which was the Diane Downs case in 1983. She told police a stranger shot her three children after she stopped to pick him up on a deserted road. It turned out that she shot the children herself. As a result, a seven-year-old girl died and her second daughter and son remained disabled. The offender is serving a life sentence with parole eligibility after 25 years for first-degree murder and attempted murder. She was already eligible for parole, but was denied parole in 2008, 2010, and 2020. All these cases have one thing in common. The mothers of the killer tried to blame their husbands for their own crime. The public and law enforcement officials began to be skeptical of women's attempt to shift the blame to the head of the family. This was one of the reasons why Pauline Zile's statement caused such a negative response. Police said Pauline's case is also not unique. All the applicant's words were confirmed. Very often, the death of a child becomes the work of a stepfather or father, while the mother remains inactive. There are also numerous cases involving postpartum depression or similar conditions in mothers. Psychiatrists noted that many terrible child deaths could be avoided if women received appropriate support. However, in the case of Pauline Zile, there were no deviations. The mother's behavior was completely conscious, as shown by a psychiatric examination. That is why she was charged under such a harsh article. All people familiar with the case materials believe that the woman could have prevented the death of her daughter. Moreover, she could not only simply stop her husband, she could provide assistance and try to call rescuers. If she called, she would have received advice and a chance to save Christine. But the mother quite consciously refused all this. In addition, as it turned out, Pauline worked as a nurse, had a medical education, and knew how to perform emergency care and knew how to perform emergency care, but she didn't even try to help her daughter. Then the trial of John Zile began. The prosecutor's office sought capital punishment for the man, namely execution in the electric chair. John admitted that he beat the girl, but refused to admit that he was responsible for her death. He claimed that he did not want to kill her. It was an accident. He simply miscalculated his strength. His first trial ended in a mistrial after the jury was divided. The second trial took place in another city, this time in November 1996, he was found guilty of first-degree murder, concealment of evidence, and aggravated child abuse. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For first-degree murder, plus 30 years for child abuse and hiding evidence, John Zile, 34, listened to the verdict with a straight face. The judge decided that the case was not so egregious, so he overturned the death penalty. If you like this content, please subscribe to the channel. Support this video with a like and share your thoughts in the comments section. Thank you all for your support and we'll see you next time.